So, dear colleagues, dear friends, good afternoon. Welcome at this uh, ESPD webinar. Uh, today we have more than 400 uh, uh, participants that registered for this uh, webinar. So this is, uh, I think, uh, a very successful uh, number of people, uh, I think, that want to join us. So thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, today we will focus on technology and how online um, services can help our sector to do what it has to do. And that means supporting persons with support needs, persons uh, with disabilities in such a way that they can uh, live a decent life and can um, remain being an active uh, citizen. Before starting with our... Um, uh, with our webinar, I would like to share with you some technical information. Um, maybe first, uh, my name and my position. I'm Luc Selderlo, Secretary General of uh, ESPD. Uh, and uh, it is important for you to know that uh, this call is uh, recorded and we will publish it. So if you miss certain parts, you can find uh, the information uh, afterwards on the ESPD website. We will also uh, provide there the presentations used by uh, the speakers. Um, everybody is muted uh, in this webinar apart from the speakers. Uh, and that is, of course, because uh, an interactive session with more than 400 people would, uh, uh, would be a bit, uh, a bit difficult. Uh, you are muted, but that does not mean that you cannot actively participate. Uh, when you uh, uh, go to the bottom of the screen, then you might find a chat box there. You can activate it by clicking on it and then uh, uh, you can write uh, in the margin at the right hand side uh, to uh, all uh, participants. Uh, you can ask questions there, you can make remarks. So feel free to use the chat box to share uh, your opinion, your views on the topics that we uh, will uh, discuss this afternoon. We also have real-time uh, captioning. Uh, again, a bottom at the uh, bottom of the screen that you can activate, closed captioning. Uh, you can click uh, there on um, sub the subtitles and then you see uh, what is said in real-time uh, in, in writing. And that can help uh, maybe especially those uh, for whom English is not their first language or their second language then so you also can read uh, what is discussed uh, here. And to facilitate participation also for our French-speaking colleagues, we have interpretation today in French. And again, that is a bottom, a bottom at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can activate uh, the, uh, the French interpretation uh, and follow everything uh, in, uh, in French. As I said already, presentations will be uh, shared. And uh, although it is not easy to make these type of webinars very interactive, please use the chat box so that uh, we can also learn from what you are doing in your region, in your country, in uh, your uh, service. Today, as I said already, we focus on uh, online uh, activities as alternatives to, to other types of service provision. We will also look in a somewhat broader context at what technology can bring. And to discuss that with you, we have uh, three top speakers. We have a representative of the World Health Organization. We have uh, a colleague here with us from uh, Israel and a colleague uh, from, uh, from Italy. And on top of that, we have a top class moderator. And I now would like to hand over to uh, the moderator for the today's uh, webinar, uh, Magdalena, who is also a staff member, colleague of, uh, my, of me uh, in the ESPD uh, office. Magdalena, we're all yours. Uh, thank you, Luke. My name is Magdalena Varsatskas, and I'm project officer at uh, ESPD. And I would like to welcome three wonderful speakers who will share their experience with us today. It's uh, Julia Ogero from GATE Initiative from WHO, Noah Nitsan uh, from Beit Isi Shapiro from Israel, and uh, Everdian Ho Hover, sorry, Everdian Hogenfert 
uh, from Ayas Bologna. And we will start with, uh, uh, with Noah, who will, uh, sorry, with Julia, who will tell us about um, recommendations of world organizations such as WHO uh, delivering the, the digital uh, solutions in area of health and social services. Julia, please start. Thank you very much, uh, Magdalena. Thank you very much, Luke, for this kind introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you. Magdalena, can you see the screen? Yes. Great, thank you very much. Thank you again and good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you online in this fantastic and informative webinar. Uh, my name is Julia. I work at the World Health Organization. And today I would like to introduce some of the WHO recommendation on the use and uh, implementation of digital health solution and also highlight some of the current uh, initiatives. By digital health, uh, we mean the use of information and communication technology, but also advanced computing sciences and the use of artificial intelligence in support of health and health related fields. And by health related fields, I also mean social and support services, for example, for older people and persons with disability. In the past few years, there has been a growing interest in the field of digital health and especially how digital health solutions can contribute to achieving the sustainable development goals and targets related to uh, universal health coverage, well-being, inclusive education, economic growth, etc. So recognizing the huge potential and value of uh, digital technology, member states at the World Health Assembly in 2018 adopted a resolution on digital health in which they commit to prioritize, develop, evaluate, and implement appropriate digital technology to improve health and beyond. I would like now to highlight some of the uh, challenges that both health and social system are facing, uh, not just now during the COVID pandemic, but some uh, broader challenges. Uh, to start with, one of the challenge is uh, often low demand for services. And uh, this, is, this is due, for example, uh, to lack of awareness often of the existence of certain services, but also the stigma. For example, some people might not want to access mental health services because of fear of being stigmatized. Another challenge is uh, uh, often the poor compliance of clients to recommendation and guideline given by health and service providers, and sometimes the lack of follow-up. So losing clients in the, in the process of care. Another challenge is the shortage of service uh, uh, providers, both in the health and social sector. WHO uh, recognized the shortage of 18 million health workers in the world. So this is definitely a, a big shortcoming of the health and social system. Also the insufficient supply of uh, medicine, medical devices, but also assistive products is a big challenge and the geographic inaccessibility of service. So services that are far away from people and not really close uh, to where people uh, live. And I think this uh, current pandemic um, is really making us reflect particularly on the geographic inaccessibility of services. And this is something that we can all think about and relate uh, to. Digital health, um, so the current COVID-19 pandemic has also triggered an unprecedented demand for digital health solutions and the WHO recognized uh, uh, the importance of using this solution to address some of the challenges that I just mentioned. Um, the digital health solution, however, should be proven to be effective, should be acceptable to both the service provider and the client should be feasible in the context where they are used, should be aligned with the universal principles of equity and human rights, and should also be regulated within a system and uh, um, regulated by legislation and policy uh, frameworks. Um, in 2019, last year, WHO released guidelines and a recommendation on uh, 10 digital interventions for uh, strengthening the health and social system. 
Um, I'm just going to mention four out of these 10 initiatives, which I think are mostly relevant for the webinar. The first is the client to provider distance support, which is the delivery of a service at a distance. And with this, we include, for example, telemedicine, so prescription of medicine, but we also include, for example, the provision of rehabilitation, uh, psychosocial and counseling support at a distance. This intervention is highly recommended, uh, provided that uh, it ensures a client's consent, client's privacy, uh, data protection. Um, also, there should be mechanisms in place to ensure that uh, the service provider has the license and the credential to perform this work. And also, WHO recommends that there should be strategy in place to ensure that persons with cognitive impairments, for example, hearing or vision uh, difficulties, can have equal access to these online services. Another intervention is the targeted client communication. This includes the use of text messages, apps, social media, and other similar means to promote uh, healthy behavior, for example, to promote diet, uh, healthy diet, exercise, but also to send reminders uh, to people on appointments. Again, this, uh, um, this type of intervention should ensure data privacy, but also should make clients aware on how to unsubscribe easily from receiving this type of communication. Digital tracking is another uh, digital health solution that is recommended by the WHO. This includes the use of uh, digitized records uh, to capture and store information related to the client in order to facilitate follow-up and also to keep track of the services that the person accessed. Again, it is very important to ensure data privacy, but also sustainability and maintenance of the IT infrastructure to prevent data loss, which unfortunately uh, might happen sometimes. Uh, the last intervention I'm gonna talk about is the service provider's decision support. This includes the use of algorithms and uh, other similar artificial intelligence tools to uh, assist the service providers in making diagnoses and taking decisions. To give an example, WHO is now working on uh, a sort of a machine learning algorithm tool that supports service providers in identify, select, and provide assistive technology and assistive devices for persons with disability, older people, etc. So these type of uh, tools are recommended, provided that they are within the scope of practice of the health providers. So the health provider should already be working on this topic uh, to use this type of tools. I would like now to mention some of the current digital health initiatives that uh, WHO, together with other partners, is uh, carrying out. The first one is the Be Healthy, Be Mobile initiative. This is a digital program that governments are using to tackle non-communicable diseases. And this digital program is designed to support people um, helping uh, quit tobacco, to control diabetes, hypertension and uh, cervical cancer. There is another app called Here WHO, which you can download on your phone. And this is basically an app to test your hearing status. So check if you are at risk of uh, having hearing loss and also monitor it uh, over time. There is another app called iCope, which again, you can download for free on your mobile uh, phone. This uh, app is mostly used by caregivers, by social workers and health workers uh, to improve health and care and well-being of older people. And finally, there is another initiative called the Keeping Young People Safe. And this is a new initiative. WHO has opened a call for proposal for a digital solution to, to address the health and well-being of adolescents and particularly address uh, uh, issues uh, such as uh, prevention of suicide, eating disorder, and uh, tackling depression among adolescents. And finally, I would like to mention some of the digital health responses specific for uh, COVID-19 that WHO is uh, carrying out um, in a partnership with the big ICT and the social media platform like Facebook. Uh, it is possible now to access on your Viber, Facebook Messenger, or WhatsApp an interactive chatbot 
to receive uh, um, timely information about COVID-19, how to prevent it and how to uh, contain the pandemic and other important information. And um, with this, I would like to finish my, my presentation and uh, I thank you very much, all of you for your uh, attention. Thanks. Thank you very much, Julia. It was very interesting. All the names of the apps, if you are interested in them, they will be sent to you after the webinar. Now I would like to invite uh, Noah Nitsan from Israel, who will tell us more about moving uh, education um, online, how they are doing it, and she will share her experience. Please, Noah. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. okay. You see my screen? It's yes, okay? Yes, thank you. Great. <clears throat> so, first of all, thank you for inviting me here to this so important webinar. Uh, my name is Noah Nitsan. I'm an occupational therapist and the director of the Technology Center at Beth Easy Shapiro in Israel. And I'm going to talk about distance learning for children with disability during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's important to emphasize this is a distance learning during the COVID-19 pandemic because it's not just a regular distance learning. It caught us by surprise. We never done this distance learning before with our student. And I'm going to show you what uh, we are doing. Just a few words about uh, my organ the organization where I work. Uh, Betty D. Shapiro is one of the leading organizations in Israel that provide services for people with disability. We have many units, but I will focus on our uh, early intervention center and special education school, which is relevant to, our, uh, to my presentation. So early intervention center for the Hebrew and Arabic speakers and special education school, and we have other activities in Israel and abroad. So the moment we realize what's going on, we start to think about what we should do. And we start with, first of all, hotline for emotional support in Hebrew, in English, in Arabic, and also other activities uh, according to legislation and other things. But I will, and I will focus on education. So if we're talking about distance learning, our main goals were to, first of all, of course, provide support and solution for children and their parents to maintain any kind uh, of routine, which is so hard these days and to continue the learning and the educational materials, but also to provide therapeutic solution, which is sometimes um, challenging because how you're doing uh, physiotherapy online or, or occupational therapy session online. So we need to change sometimes a little bit our main goals. And we're doing online session and real-time group, also one-on-one, -on -one, and also pre-recorded session, which we find was the best solution. And we need also to support our staff. We're using many kinds of technology. Most of them are very mainstream, like smartphone or laptop, uh, also iPad TV or Apple TV, mainstream software and apps like uh, Zoom, WhatsApp, YouTube, PowerPoint, and more specific ones like uh, open platform apps like TinyTap or JTAP, which allow us to create our own activities, or Matific, which is a great app for math. The, you all can use it. It's in all languages. and. Uh, AAC, which is Augmentative Alternative Communication Softwares. We all use it all the time, but now it's even more important. And accessible game websites like Ginger Tiger or Help Kids Learn, which are great all over the year, but now we, it's even more important when the children are at home all day. So here are a few examples. Uh, we have a virtual kindergarten. This is the schedule. Uh, it's in Hebrew, so it's from right to left. Each day, uh, it starts with a morning circle and then other activities and each cubic when it's a link to a video. So we have a special YouTube channel with all the videos uh, that we pre-recorded and it's open. Everyone in Israel can use it. Um, many children and families use it, not just ours. So this is the YouTube channel and you can find our uh, physiotherapy session and ideas of things you can do from home, practice speech and language skills with speech therapies. Um, every Friday we have the Shabbat ceremony, which is something that uh, in Israel, it's very in our routine and children really like it with the candle and the wine and everything. We call it Kabbalah Shabbat and everybody knows it's on Friday morning. And from a school, we work a little different. Our staff uh, make more, most of the things from their home and they have to be more creative. So there is a language lesson and a math lesson and a sport and yoga and ideas of play and many things. And also, again, we have a special YouTube channel for that. 
And here's an example of a langu language lesson. So the teacher here, Hani, she, she made this uh, lesson with the grid three. This is the program that we're using with the symbol. That it's very familiar to the children, they know it. She made this video at home, uh, pre-recorded it, send it and put it on the YouTube channel, but also send it to the students. If they have an iPad with a grid, they can really use it, uh, not just to see the video, and they can use it and activate it uh, in their own devices. And this is another example of the OT staff. Um, they took funny faces, it's a very common card game in Israel, and they show the children how they can use it in digital way, even if they don't have the uh, game at home, and also to encourage the interaction between the children. And this is another example of encourage interaction. It's something very important for us. Uh, the, the children were so excited to see each other. So uh, we did this Zoom bingo with all the school, all the staff, all the children, and we made this special board. It was about Passover, it was two weeks ago. It was great fun. We have also a student council all over the year according to our advocacy program that we're having. And also this uh, day is the continue with the meetings, the virtual meetings. And they decided to write a greeting card to the friends. So this is what they decided to write. Again, it's from right to left. Uh, the student council wishes all the students stay in touch, be healthy, feel good, we love you, uh, sleep a lot. That's what they decided to um, say to their friends. So we need to support a family. It's, it's a very stress, stressful situation for all of us and for sure for a family with children with disability. So all the materials are sent to the parent and to the child device like I explained before. And the pre-recorded session are accessible at any time, which is the most convenient way to the families because you don't limit it to specific hours, like an online session. It was nice to see that now some of the parents, we see them more than we see before the corona. Uh, we see more parents than before. And here are some of our conclusions. So first of all, it was a sudden need. We're learning, learning as we go. We, know, we are now much smarter than we were before. And it's not easy for every team member. Some of them are less confident and we have to understand that everyone is different. The planning and the implementation of the, se of the session takes time. It's a lot of time to do all the preparation and we have many meetings at the evening. But we have now a great database of learning materials and methods that we can use in the future. What, uh, another thing is that now we, uh, we learn how to use those tools and we can use it in other situations. For example, if a child is going to be in hospital for a long time or sick at home, now we know so well to use this distance learning that we can use it. And also, we realize that it's much easier for two parents to have meetings with Zoom. Before, when we have evening meetings at uh, Betty Z Shapiro, many parents didn't come. But now when it's with Zoom, they're all attending and we realize it's better to do it with Zoom even after the corona. So we get excellent uh, positive feedback from many parents, not just ours, but also the students that are not participating and we have to follow up and see how we can help them. And that's it. Uh, we have a blog, it's called Tech it is in English. It's also in Hebrew and Arabic with a lot of information. And the last post was about the coronavirus and uh, things that you can do from home. There is a list of recommended apps. You can sign up and get all the posts uh, directly to your email. It's free, of course. We develop a few apps. They're all free also. I uh, hope you find them useful. We have two upcoming webinars. Actually, one is uh, this evening, is about augmentative alternative communication and for children with disability. And the second is uh, next week about technology and play. You're very welcome, it's free. And here are some of the resources that I mentioned, um, like accessible game website and other things. So Thank that's you. it. Thank you, Toda. Thank you very much, Noah. It was very interesting and I would say very optimistic how successfully you managed to move uh, your services online to support your students. Um, and the materials, I'm sure, will be very interesting for our participants. Uh, thank you again. Uh, and thank now, you. thank you. Now I'd like to invite Evertian uh, from IS Bologna, who will Tell us, share with us how his organization is managing uh, to move the services, support services uh, online. Uh, <clears throat> yes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Evertian Hogerwerf. I'm uh, 
uh, work for AAS Bologna, which is an organization, a service provider in, uh, in uh, Bologna in Italy. Um, uh, basically, we do a wide range of, uh, of, of services. I will particularly focus on uh, some experiences that we are currently, uh, let's say, developing in the assistive technology area. Uh, but we also have day uh, care services, home care services, and some residential care facilities. Uh, we further have uh, introduced <coughs> or set up since uh, a couple of months a uh, research center for uh, innovation, which is called uh, the We Care More Center. And that is all focused on the digitalization of, uh, of services. Uh, we have about 100 100 staff, uh, among which uh, 25 work in the uh, assistive technology uh, center. Uh, this AT center is uh, actually part of the, the public health uh, trust. So we, we, although it's staffed by uh, our our people, uh, the services come under the uh, umbrella of the of public health, which means that they're free of charge for the uh, for the end users. Uh, and for the professionals that are seeking support in, in uh, let's say, uh, uh, bringing technology, introducing technology into the lives of people with disabilities. Um, our core activity is actually uh, assessing people, so advising persons with disabilities regarding what technology can do for them. And we also have a, a specific track uh, which is more focused on environmental adaptation. So where we advise on uh, barriers that people find in their living environment, whether this is home or school or, or a workplace and, and how these barriers can be, can be overcome or removed. Um, so as mentioned, the services mainly consist in providing uh, assessments, which means bringing the people to the to the AT center and uh, looking into their needs, but also in support and in training. And support then is uh, very often done in situations. So as soon as uh, the people have their equipment, uh, we will we will help them in setting it up and and making it work, and can also train them and their informal caregivers. So that is in a in a nutshell what we what we do in the center here in uh, in Bologna. Now, when uh, the COVID crisis started, of course, we were uh, uh, heavily uh, challenged uh, to, to see how we continue de delivering those services. Uh, and the first idea was, of course, to move them uh, online. Uh, but that is, that is much easier uh, said than done, as you can imagine. Uh, so what we did is we started with uh, uh, analyzing aspects of our service delivery process and try to imagine the expected uh, issues that we could have in moving them uh, online. Uh, here on the table you can see of, of some of the outcomes of that reflection and uh, basically on the left hand side you see uh, our work which is related to the assessment in, in assistive technology needs or so looking into into what kind of solutions uh, uh, can be uh, can be useful uh, or how we can help the user identifying which technology work best for him or for her and that uh, covers a, a uh, of course, I simplified it here, but anyway, it's so, sort of a step-by-step -step approach, um, which is uh, related to the, the management of, of course, of the case. So uh, receiving the, 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 the demand, uh, analyzing it, uh, getting to know the person, uh, discussing uh, wishes and, 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 and needs, uh, where the technology is going to be used, how it's going to be used, what is the purpose of using the technology. Uh, then we normally do a very in-depth analysis of the condition and of the real life context of the, of the client and we start to discuss uh, solutions with very often because we have a, a big big center here with a large showroom of all the, the let's say the demo center of all the different uh, different solutions doing a lot of uh, testing with uh, hands-on directly um, uh, with the multi-professional team of, uh, of experts on what might work or not might work and then uh, support and training. Now as you can see uh, from the, uh, the, the, the evaluation uh, some of this is uh, we expected to be able to, to, to deliver well uh, remotely as well. Other issues especially uh, the, the knowledge of the real life context of the, of the user and, and especially the, the hands-on on testing of the devices were very much more difficult to manage to be able to deliver uh, online. Uh, same with uh, environmental 
adaptation uh, assessments. Uh, again, uh, here the, 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 it, the situation was a little bit more promising. Um, knowledge of the person, case management, and uh, the, the discussion of the solutions, uh, which normally uh, happens by sharing designs, pictures, and, and sketches, uh, were expected to be quite quite easy to do. Uh, and also with the use of uh, video cameras and, and other ICT equipment and uh, a better understanding of the life context of the and the barriers in the environment. And what is a little bit more difficult here to imagine is that you can actually also support people in following an up. So when the when the uh, uh, mainly because a lot of that that work, so really intervention, uh, uh, building intervention in the house is actually uh, uh, not done in this in this COVID moment. Um, so after that initial assessment, we decided to do uh, a lot of research and, and testing out solutions. We uh, found uh, after an, an, quite an extensive uh, literature review, six useful articles uh, of people that had tried uh, similar things with uh, some methodological and technical indications. We tested all the different video conferencing platforms and apps that uh, are useful here for um, and to be used in, in remote service delivery and uh, we analyzed the key requirements of our service and the factors for success and failure based on the, the expertise of the team. Uh, this all led to a review of our uh, protocols. Um, I brought the two, two areas of intervention together here. Uh, so, for example, for the case management, uh, including the reporting, uh, of course, this situation affects also the, 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 the staff. So the staff is working basically from home. Um, and to be able to do that, we uh, equipped them uh, as far as they didn't already have this, the, the technology themselves. And we moved the whole client's management database uh, to the cloud. Uh, regarding the knowledge of the person and the needs and the wishes, uh, we uh, reviewed our uh, initial, uh, let's say, uh, checklist of information that we require before we plan an assessment uh, and uh, more questions were introduced there, more in-depth preparation uh, uh, was required here and if necessary a video call could be organized uh, before the actual day of the assessment with the multidisciplinary team and that is basically also to not only to collect information but also to test the, the video connection. Mm, then the uh, regarding the analysis of the condition and the real-life context of the client, uh, the, uh, the multidisciplinary team connects from different uh, sites uh, into the same session. Uh, there's a protocol for structuring that intervention. Uh, we had to review our data protection procedures because we, we are, we are uh, videotaping uh, everything. Everything is uh, recorded. Uh, consent is repressed uh, verbally uh, by, the, by the people. Uh, and then, um, so what was actually, uh, as a matter of fact, quite quite uh, easier than expected was to be able to discuss uh, possible solutions. So, especially in the case of the environmental uh, adaptations, to share designs and pictures and sketches, and to discuss with the uh, uh, the people on the other side uh, in the context uh, what uh, what what could be um, the solution. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, it is uh, virtually impossible to do, uh, let's say, ICT, AT assessments, but also uh, more complex wheelchair assessments uh, remotely. So that is something that we have uh, have left out and is suspended at the moment. And then finally, um, the um, uh, support and also training in the use of assistive technology is actually quite easy to be done uh, remotely uh, because uh, there are also softwares that you allow, for example, to uh, get into the uh, uh, remotely log into the computer of the uh, of the uh, of the, uh, the the end user and to to fix issues or to uh, uh, reconfigure the the system. Uh, 
Uh, of course, we are very keen on killer factors, uh, and this actually is a sort of a stop and, and go list. Uh, when any of these factors here uh, are, are not met, then it's better not to do. Uh, to try, even to try an assessment uh, online. Uh, personal factors, the lack of motivation from the other side, people don't really believe that it can work. Uh, uh, there's lack of self-confidence. There's not a, a competent in terms of, uh, let's say, a caregiver able to uh, maneuver uh, an, uh, a video device. Uh, lack of digital skills and, and of course for certain types of impairments it's, it's even more difficult than for others. There are technological factors, there should be good connectivity, uh, there's a, maybe a lack of personal equipment on the other side and uh, environmental factors. We need uh, uh, of course a, a room which is uh, uh, light and not too noisy and able to, uh, in order to be able to work. Uh, so this leads me to my final slide with a couple of uh, recommendations. Here you can see uh, Chiara at work. Uh, this morning she was uh, helping a family in redesigning the, the bathroom. Um, so moving services online require a very careful analysis of, uh, of different factors. Uh, first of all, the nature of the service. Uh, what what are actually what are actually what is actually your service? What does it consist in, and, and what are the objectives? Uh, factors for success and 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 failure, as I as I showed you, stop and go criteria. At a certain moment, you have to to say, okay, we go for it or we don't do it because the risks are too high. Uh, context readiness. Uh, there might be economic implement implement. For example, we still don't know whether the the public the funding authority, the public health trust, will actually uh, refund us, reimburse us for the work that we're doing during this crisis with uh, online support. Um, the long-term impact on on the servers, the on on the users, and also again on on the funding agencies, and uh, the risk and unexpected or unwilling effects. For example, uh, a risk would be that a funding agency says, "Okay, well, this is actually very, quite quite nice. It's probably also saving me money. So why not do it in uh, in the future uh, to continue to do it?" So uh, that kind of uh, um, um, yeah, the, you have to be very careful with, uh, uh, with uh, risk and, and effects that at the moment are not really foreseeable, but you can, of course, as a group of people, as a team of people, reflect on them. So that's what I had to say. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Abantian. It was very, very interesting. Um, now we will share, uh, our, we collected questions uh, from our participants. So we have very many, but we'll try to answer at least a few of them. Uh, first one, I, will, uh, I would like to ask uh, Julia. Uh, we have a question. Uh, does uh, WHO recommend any secure, safe platforms? As there are like some, a uh, lot of queries uh, regarding security of Zoom, WhatsApp, and etc. Mm. Thank you, Magdalena. And thank you for uh, all people online for asking this question. Um, while there are no official guidelines and recommendations from WHO on use of platform, I can say that uh, WHO staff, consultants, interns at the moment are using are uh, sort of using more Microsoft Teams compared to other platform, and um, so I'm not officially recommending that you should use this, but it's just uh, the choice that WHO made when uh, we uh, started working more remotely. Um, I, I'm aware of, I heard of a uh, Zoom meeting being uh, hacked and uh, like th there are uh, some quite a few cases. Um, so perhaps the Microsoft team could be a, a good option if you feel that Zoom is not, is not that safe. Okay, thank you very much, um, Julia. Now I have uh, another question. Uh, this one is to Noah. Uh, what is the experience uh, in group distance activities? Optimum, maybe you can uh, recommend the optimal number of participants. Um, how would you organize like group sessions? Um, in our school, the, there is a, around eight students in the classroom. So this is around the number when we are doing the online session and it's, it's okay. I don't think that we have a session that everyone attended. Uh, but we were surprised that it's, it worked out pretty well. 
uh, the children were really into it. They were so excited to see each other. At the beginning, we were afraid that uh, they will not understand what's going on and there will be a lot of noise and uh, they, it will be hard for them to, um, to manage it, but it was okay. So I think small group, it depends, of course, of the children. It's not, I can't say a number, that, but in our experience, around eight children is okay. And the teacher need to be really, really prepared, or the teacher or the therapist that's doing this will really, really prepare advance what she's going to do. And to be also relaxed, it's okay if something, uh, she needs to do some changes in, in, uh, um, in the middle, but uh, she needs to be prepared to understand, maybe to send something in advance to the parents to be more prepared. Um, and that is our experience. But like I said in presentation, at the end, what was the best, it was the pre-recorded lesson that they can come back and see whatever, because the parents are at home with few children. And uh, I have my own experience also with my own private children, at the same time to have many online sessions. So it's good to have it pre-recorded and then every child can go whenever uh, it's um, suitable for him. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, now um, I will ask uh, Evertian, uh, do you have experience in your organization since you uh, mentioned that you have some residential services? The question is, do you have experience in distance support for persons at residential services whose rights are limited at the high le highest level? Um, well, well, I mean, the, the, the good thing about the residential services uh, is that there are uh, still people providing care um so that's not for us at this stage a priority of course we have care workers in the residential services and there are a lot of different other problems related to uh, as you can imagine uh, keeping safe um, but uh, there are uh, for example we we support some people that are in in in, a, in a residential areas uh, uh, for example uh, people that are in rehabilitation clinics and that have to return home uh, and then they, uh, I mean, these are sometimes quite urgent or that come out of the hospital and have to return home. And then they find their homes full of barriers and with lack of assistive technology. So in that case, it is important to act uh, quite, quite urgently. We further have a special service delivery track for people with very rapid developing pathologies. And I can assure you that two months in the, the life of a, of a person with an ALS, for example, uh, is really a long period and there can be a, a, a huge decline. So in that case, as we, we come in as well with our remote services. What I wanted to add actually is that we, I think it's not, okay, uh, now it's total lockdown and then all of a sudden we will, we will be able to, to go back to normality. Uh, there will very likely be a long period during which we, uh, uh, we have to 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 work under sort of kind of hybrid conditions, so which means that you maybe are able to send one person into a situation who can then, for example, support a connection and and provide some advice while the rest of the multidisciplinary multidisciplinary team is working remotely. Um, or, for example, that you can uh, actually uh, bring uh, technology into the homes of people and then see how that works uh, with, with a person and instead of having them here in the AT center. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very floating situation. The question is a little bit, what can we learn from this? I mean, what can, what can remain afterwards? What can we uh, use? What can we uh, uh, learn as a lesson to make our services increasingly effective? But it will def definitely not totally substituting uh, the way that we were used to work, which is much more, of course. Uh, I mean, there's nothing better than having directly contact with your end users. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Avertian. Uh, the next question I will direct uh, to Noah again. Um, the question is, you've shown us lots of YouTube videos, apps for phone, iPad, etc. Have you got a team who is responsible for technical tasks, videos, developing apps, uh, or how can you create these things? Okay, so first of all, uh, yeah, we have uh, the technology center. It's a bit easy and in the school, in the kindergarten, we have a team that's in charge of this. Uh, the, the app that I've shown, it's not related to the corona, it was before. Um, but all the things that we are doing, the old stuff, we have to really teach the stuff how to use the Zoom and it was a lot of brainstorming how to do it. But at the end, we do have few um, more technical people in our team that uh, 
support everything. Yeah, from uh, the, but also from other units from Bet Easy. It was a lot of work from all the units in Bet Easy. We found it so important. So uh, we okay. put a lot of resources on this. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, I would direct both to you, Noah and uh, Evertian. Uh, what is your experience uh, in the individual, this more maybe to Noah, but we'll see. Uh, what is the experience of, of yours uh, in the individual distant activities uh, to continue them uh, online organization of the session? Uh, what is the character of the sessions, therapeutic or developmental? Not sure I understood. Sorry. Um, well, I think the question was, uh, how do you manage, since you had sessions, you had yeah. plan of therapy before coronavirus, mm -hmm. and suddenly the session was cut, the, 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 ses the plan of the sessions, the, the therapy was cut, and you tried to move it uh, online. Right. Uh, how does it work? What is your experience with this type so, of yeah, so we had to do um, to talk about the expectation with the parents, what we can do online, and sometimes we change a little bit because we cannot do everything uh, online. So um, at the school, we did we did uh, many groups and a lot of support to the parents and tell them what they can do. Not everything was one on one with the child, more like support and guidance to the parents. And we start to use the online, but I have to say that now in Israel, we start very slowly, the special education system starts slowly to go back to normal and we are in the middle of both. So we are also in the stage that we are going back to the regular uh, days, but we had to learn how to do it. But, uh, of course, it's not ideal. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one is for Evertian. Um, Not too difficult, how, please. Uh, okay, I'll try. Uh, how did you uh, get to contact with the service user at home? Uh, yeah, I, I was just responding to that question in the oh. chat box. I think it came from Alexander. Uh, so basically, we are we are a well-known center, uh, which means that people uh, know us, know about us, and also the uh, let's say the the health and social care services in the region knows us, know, know about our existence. So we they they just refer people to us, and because we are re we are still reachable online and by phone, of course. So uh, which means that that after a phone call and an, a, a little bit more a profound uh, assessment you can you can already understand whether you can actually help a person or not so uh, we, are, we, are, we it's not a fixed number of people or a fixed group of people that we are supporting many people come back of course in the in the course of the years uh, but but basically it's a, it's a continuously turnover we see about 500 people every uh, every year Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, one of the questions was also, I don't know if we are honestly speaking able to, to answer this question, but I, it appeared also in many discussions we had with different service providers. What can we do when the problem is more technical, when the families, they don't have access to technology, when they don't have um, access to internet or not good quality of internet, when they don't have good computer or good enough computer, do you have any ideas and the suggestions which way, which direction the, our members could go? Uh, if I can respond to that, uh, that is of course a killer factor for us. Uh, although we have a loan library, so we, we have a wide range of tablets and, and laptops that we can loan to people. The question is how to get them to the family because they have to, uh, I mean, we, we are not supposed to travel. Uh, uh, even across the city might be difficult and the police might stop you. Uh, but that is something that we do. So we have technical people here. I think that was one of the other questions of seven or eight of the 25 mm -hmm. are actually ICT technicians and AT experts. And uh, so they prepare uh, uh, the PCs and then leave them in the secretariat uh, where people can come and pick them up and we loan them for, for the time being. Yeah, the connection is, is a bigger problem because that's something that we cannot solve. Although in some, uh, let's say, health uh, 
uh, interventions, but that is more experimental uh, area where we are trying to move into now in connected healthcare. Uh, we have small uh, small boxes with an uh, with a SIM card uh, that we can uh, leave to people, so they they have a connection as well for. But that's only for limited periods, a month or so. Thank you, Martian. Uh, now there is uh, one more question uh, for you. Uh, do you think that it's possible to implement occupation activities via distance uh, online? Um, yeah, we are do occupation therapy sessions and it depends on the goal. So it could be if it's uh, sometimes we have uh, technological goals, which is easier like to do something technology on, um, online. But everything, if you're working, for example, about uh, eating, even a uh, dependent skill, we do it with the child in order to feel for OTs uh, eating together, each one from their own homes and talk about what they did in school before or to, to work about fine motor skills. So yeah, we are doing those things and all the Facebook groups, there's a lot of ideas now how to do it online, but there are uh, ideas. But like I said before, a lot of support to the parents and guide them but also on, with the child on the screen. And I would like to add also that sometimes if you don't have enough technology, I mean, you use the laptop or iPad, but sometimes it's also could be the phone um, and it could be good enough. I know that sometimes you don't even have even a phone, but sometimes it could be good enough uh, to do video and uh, to play together. Let's play together through the screen and uh, draw together many things that you can do and encourage them to do things with the friend also. Okay, thank you. And I have uh, the last question since we are coming, we are coming close to the end of our webinar. Uh, and this, this question is directed to all, uh, all our panelists. Uh, what do you think uh, is needed from service providers to move into online supports? Support, what, 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 what we need the most? Or how can we support service providers in moving online? Uh, if I can, I can answer. For, um, I, I think what, what is, I mean, technical knowledge, you know, competence, all that kind of stuff you can, you can quite easily find. I think the most important thing is to have a sort of a strategic, strategic plan in your head to, to, to really do not, I mean, now it just overcame a lot of people, you know, uh, and then, okay, you have to improvise and maybe people will think that they're doing great jobs and we'll see in the end whether everything was actually done so well or not. Uh, what is important that if you, if you want to move into this field, and I think you have to because the digitalization in society is, is not no longer an option, uh, then, then actually you should, you should really make this one of your key strategic development points means, uh, knowing what you're talking about, addressing all the issues, having your staff trained, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Vardian. Now, would you like to add something? No, just that I agree. This is the, I think this is the thing to understand what are the priorities and to see that uh, we need to investigate it. Thank you. Julia, any comments on that? Yes, uh, thank you, Magdalena. I think I will just like to maybe stress the fact that it's really important that governments have an emergency preparedness plan in place because what we are going through now, it's an emergency and it's good to react to an emergency, but more important is to have a clear preparedness plan in place. And this really includes to think about 360 degrees of what could be the implication of the next pandemic, how can we really make sure that people continue have access to services, whether they are of health services or social services. So really working on the preparedness, I think it's really important. And then really echo what uh, Everjan already mentioned about the competencies and skills of, uh, of the health staff is, uh, and, and social staff is really important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to give back the floor to Luke, who will make a final conclusion of our webinar. And on my side, I would like to invite everyone who is interested in uh, technology to participate in our PCT group meeting, uh, person-centered technology meeting during uh, ESPD online conference, uh, which uh, the meeting is uh, planned for the 6th of May at 1.30. If you register to our conference, you can also participate in, in our meeting. So I would like to invite everyone who would like to know more or share their experience to join our meeting. Thank you very much and look. 
Thank you, Magdalena, and thank you for uh, moderating this, uh, this uh, very interesting, uh, fascinating uh, panel uh, debate and, and, and webinar. Uh, many questions uh, remain unanswered, but I can uh, assure and reassure all those that asked questions. The ESPD team will look at the questions and try to come back to you, or we will try to provide answers on our Facebook page. Most of you might have seen it already. ESPD has a dedicated Facebook page where we try to, uh, to exchange ideas and, and, and practices related to this uh, corona crisis. So we will try to provide answers on all your questions uh, on that Facebook page. For our members, we also have an, uh, a help desk. So if you ask questions to that help desk, then uh, we will come back to you with, uh, with answers. Uh, some conclusions, uh, some conclusions. Uh, I, I think that uh, the first thing that is clear, I think we had now three speakers, but we could have had 50, 60, 70 speakers. I think there, is, there are so many things going on, on in our sector and that proves the uh, capacity for our sector to innovate when it is really difficult. We as a sector, we show that we are social entrepreneurs and a lot of innovative practices are developed and, and implemented. And I would say that is for me the first conclusion. What was presented here uh, by the three speakers is, is top class material without any doubt. Very good, inspiring, but there is so many good innovation out there. Uh, and that is thanks to the entrepreneurial uh, spirit that we have in the sector and which is uh, so important. That would be my first conclusion. And we will try to capitalize on that ESPD is uh, developing a project uh, through which we will try to identify strong models, good models of, of practices that prove to work during this uh, crisis. And we will try to do some quality assessment of these uh, models, of these practices. And then we would like to explore together with our members how we can upscale this and make these practices uh, mainstream in uh, the services sector. So we will work on that and we will uh, come back to you uh, later on with uh, more concrete <laughs> ideas on this project uh, pretty strong. So that is uh, a first very important element. A second very important element is that technology is a tool. It is not the objective. Technology should be used to do what it should do. What we want is high quality, personalized, tailor-made support that allows people to enjoy their human rights, to be an active citizen, to be actively involved in community life, in the labor market, in education. Uh, and that, that, is, that, is our, that is the objective, that is the goal, not the use of technology. Of course, technology offers uh, an enormous amount of opportunities and some of them were uh, presented here. We should uh, embrace all these opportunities, I think. But it is not about the technology, it is about the quality of life that uh, we uh, try to facilitate uh, thanks to this uh, technology. Uh, Julia shared with us some very important uh, key criteria, I think, to do the assessment of what works and what doesn't work. It is indeed about effectiveness, effectiveness. it is about acceptance, by the people themselves. It is about equal access. It's about respect of privacy. It is all uh, stipulated very clearly in her uh, PowerPoint, which is available uh, to all of you. And the same goes for the other uh, PowerPoints. So the message is also the shift to online will not always be the answer, but there are many, many opportunities there. Uh, I also think that it was clear uh, and it was said by, by the different speakers, uh, the technology is there, there are many options and, and possibilities, but when you implement it, it's not only about technology. It is also about reorganizing your organization, adapting, modifying the management system, the, the steering system of the organization, and it is also about investing in staff and in users and families. Only when we do that, I think we can uh, talk about successful uh, implementation of uh, digital tools and online uh, support. What I also picked up and we will, uh, and I can guarantee you that, that we will uh, work on these issues. What I also picked up is that uh, lobby work has to be done to make sure that the online support work that we do now is 
um, respected and valorized by the funders. At this stage, not all online uh, support is, uh, is uh, accepted by, by funders, so we will do lobby work around that. Uh, we will work on that uh, together with the European uh, institutions, the European Social Fund and so on, to make sure that also online support is seen as uh, a very effective uh, way to uh, support uh, people. These are my conclusions. We will come back to it. Magdalena is already thinking about another follow-up webinar uh, for, let's say, in, in uh, six to eight weeks from now. So we will come back to technology. We will identify models of good practice and we will develop projects around the further uh, spread of uh, the, the good practices that we uh, identify thanks to sessions such as this one. Last but not least, a warm thank you to Julia. Noah and Evertjan, thank you for bringing up uh, the, the models of good practice, the many ideas for sharing uh, uh, your thoughts, your views on how we can do better in these very challenging times. Last but not least, please don't miss our next webinar. Our next webinar will be on ethical issues, how to organize triage. We know that in some countries, uh, emergency units, hospitals, uh, even rehabilitation centers have to work with certain triage criteria to see whether people have access to uh, highly specialized uh, health services and support. We will discuss that during our uh, next uh, webinar on Wednesday, the 29th uh, of April at uh, two o'clock. Uh, again, join our Facebook, join our uh, help desk, and as Magdalena said, on the 4th and the 5th of May, we also organize a set of webinars on employment of persons with a disability. So also there, there is an opportunity uh, for all of you to uh, learn, to contribute, to share, and to together grow as, uh, as a sector. Thank you very much for being uh, with us and see you uh, back uh, maybe for next week's uh, webinar on ethical issues and triage. Bye-bye and thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.